Hey everybody, just a quick little prelude note here from Noel. Our last few episodes we've been recording in kind of a weird scrambled up order, mostly due to scheduling reasons in terms of our guests and other things that have been going on in our lives. Typically, when we record out of order, we would try to make sure that we don't mention any of the episodes that we've recorded already that won't be posting until after the ones that we're currently recording, you know, just to try to keep our episode release chronological. However, we kind of slipped on that, and so several times throughout this episode, you're going to hear us make mention of Escape from L.A., despite that being an episode that's going to be coming up after this one. Because, yeah, we did record Escape from L.A. first. So hopefully that won't create too much confusion for you as you're all like, hey, wait, I don't remember listening to an Escape from L.A. episode yet. We'll get to it. Anyways, sorry to jump in. Enjoy the show. Warning. This episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, your go-to source for John Carpenter opinions. My name is Alex, and joining me is my co-host, Noel. Hello. And joining us, a very special guest, Angie Tusa. Hello. Who we're having back from Christine. Yes. It's going to be interesting to go from the Stephen King one to the kind of Stephen King one. Stephen King references galore, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, of course, we're talking about In the Mouth of Madness. And back in our Christine episode, we all waxed philosophical about our past history with Stephen King. Mm. I think that made up like a good 20 minutes of the episode. <laughs> now, this film, it's not just a pastiche of Stephen King, but also a pastiche of H.P. Lovecraft. Mm. And why don't we just kind of go around just what is our past experience with H.P. Lovecraft? Craft. I know this is kind of sacrilegious on the internet, but I have no past experience with H.P. Lovecraft outside of references and Stephen King books, Hellboy and what have you. It's never really interested me. I've kind of been on record as not being a fan of horror of like, I don't know how to describe it, like intangible horror where there's no rules and it's sort of like hell dimensions and like nightmare creatures and stuff like that. It's never really floated my boat since the uh, days of watching Hellraiser 2. So I, I've never really <laughs> sought out H.P. Lovecraft. I've heard good things. Have you ever seen any of the movies like Reanimator or From Beyond or Dagon? Reanimator I've seen. So I enjoyed that. So there you go. And Angie? Kind of similar. I've certainly read lots of inspired by Lovecraft fiction. I've seen inspired by Lovecraft movies, but I've never actually delved into the author himself. After hearing some of your impressions, not really enthusiastic to do so. My best experience back in high school was when I first got into reading a lot of horror, like Stephen King, Clive Barker, and that, of course, led me to read Lovecraft. And I had one of those best of anthologies with like 20 short stories, and I want to say I read like half of them. Because there were some that I just couldn't get into, some that were a little weird, some that were ridiculously racist. <laughs> mm. Big ones that stand out for me, Call of Cthulhu, Reanimator, The Dunwich Horror, stuff like that. And in prep for this show, I was like, hey, I'll read all of H.P. Lovecraft. Oh, wow. <laughs> so for the last year and a half, I found like an ebook of all of his stories, but it was lacking half of his stories. So I went and put the rest of them in hmm. and it's like 2,200 pages long. I've made it about 900 pages in so far. Wow. So I've made it just a little over a third of the way through his entire output. And Lovecraft has talent. He definitely does know how to paint dread well. He knows how to paint a lot of horrors and speakable terror well. And despite his prose being very purple, I actually like it. But a lot of his terror comes from xenophobia and racism. Mm -hmm. Like to the point where Call of Cthulhu is all about how the minorities are going to turn against us one day. You get to this point where he moves to New York and is suddenly surrounded by people of other ethnicities and he just gets even more bitter and more bitter. Mm -hmm. His stories just are very ugly. They're very much written from the point of view of a sheltered white guy who lived in the house with his aunts, who never went outside and never met anyone who was outside of his circle of acceptance. 
until he was forced to and then reacted to it very bitterly. Mm. There is a lot of genuine talent in his work, but the core of it just comes from such a bad place that I prefer what other people have done with it, like with Hellboy or like a lot of the Stephen King stuff. And again, setting up Stephen King, he did a lot of stories that are based around a fictional small town. Like that's where Arkham comes from. And the Arkham Asylum mm -hmm. was named after his town of Arkham. Mm -hmm. A lot of his scientists studied at Miskatonic University. He kind of set up a shared universe where everything kind of loosely crosses over with everything else. Like they all exist in one little bubble universe. It's been kind of neat seeing Stephen King play with that, with like, you know, his Castle Rock and everything. Yeah. But the other problem is Lovecraft can't write characters. He can write <laughs> incidents, but he can't write characters. Mm. So a lot of his characters are just an insane guy gibbering in an asylum about the horrible things he witnessed that made him insane. And mm -hmm. this book, if you read it, it'll make your hair go white. You'll go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and what's weird is his elder gods are just cranky old people who lost. Like Cthulhu is an old space wizard who lost a war and is just sulking on an island so it's like that's not even scary <laughs> he's an old guy literally chasing people off his lawn <laughs> with tentacles and he just happens to i guess look ugly enough that he makes people go insane well he is a giant octopus monster yeah but you know it's like alan moore replaced the beard with tentacles <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll probably get a god that alan moore worships too ironically <laughs> 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 Lovecraft has been an interesting journey. I'm glad I'm taking a break from it for a while. I will continue at some <laughs> point. I do want to recommend, just on a quick side note, just to tie in a little bit with your Return to the Dreaming show that you did a while back mm. with JD, Angie. He's known for his horror stories, but he has this smaller group of stories where they follow this guy named Randolph Carter who, when he goes to sleep, enters this fantasy dreamscape that ties into things that are happening on Earth. So it's like all these elder gods, but kind of viewed from an alternate perspective. Hmm. And instead of like fear and horror, he's usually going off on these quests. And there's a lot of aspects of those stories, especially there's like a full novella that was written called The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath which are very, very reminiscent of stuff that Neil Gaiman later did in Sandman. Okay. Randolph Carter does sound vaguely familiar to me. I don't know if somebody else had referenced it or... Oh, probably. Uh, but yeah. I know Gaiman's referenced it repeatedly. Yeah, makes sense. Anyways, I do recommend those. But yes, we're doing In the Mouth of Madness. Now, is this a film either of you had seen before? Yeah, I rented it when it came out, didn't know it was John Carpenter, and I thought it was great at the time. I'm not going to say what I think now, but I thought it was a very sophisticated, ahead-of-its-time movie, and I enjoyed it immensely. I had not. I know I had at least heard of it. I don't know if it ever came on cable back in the day or anything, but it's certainly a title that I was very familiar with, but I had never actually seen the movie itself. I saw it back in the mid-90s. I never saw it in theaters, but I saw it pretty soon when it came out on video. And that was right around the time when I was learning about John Carpenter and seeing his other movies, so I did have that association pretty early on. I think I saw this before I even read any Stephen King. Hmm. Okay. I know that this led into some of my perceptions of Stephen King kind of seeing a pastiche <laughs> and then going to the real stuff. I watched it quite a bit in the 90s, but I haven't seen it in like 15 years. So this is my first time revisiting it. So after the slump of the early 90s, Carpenter was in the middle of a nice five-year run here where he was managing to get out of film a year, which would be great if he could still manage that. Mm -hmm. In the Mouth of Madness was written and executive produced by Michael DeLuca. DeLuca doesn't have a huge wealth of writing credits. Angie, he wrote the old Dollar Baby short adaptation of Lawnmower Man. Oh, okay. And he was the story editor on Dark Justice and the Freddy's Nightmares television series, for which he also wrote the pilot, which explored Freddy Krueger's origin story. After initial scripts were tossed out, he wrote the final draft of Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. And he has story credits on Sylvester Stallone's Judge Dredd and a single episode of Star Trek Voyager. However, as a producer and studio executive, he has been one of the major players in Hollywood since the late 80s, where his buddy Robert Shea co-founded New Line Cinema and brought him in as the president of production. So he was literally involved in managing what all the films were that they made every year. It's a good gig. Yeah. Meaning, Angie, he was also directly involved in the other Lawnmower Man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> He just really likes the lawnmower, man. Apparently. And literally, it was because of that dollar baby that that's why you brought it. To oh, he had the rights to the name already, so. Yeah. Damn you. It's an adaptation. No, it's not. There is an adaptation within mm, it. We've already had this argument. Yes. <laughs> 
So anyways, in 2001, as New Line was finally being folded into Warner Brothers, DeLuca left and then became president of production at DreamWorks. And in 2004, he moved to Sony. And in 2015, he moved to Universal. He has three Oscar nominations as a producer for The Social Network, Moneyball, and Captain Phillips. And most recently, he's producing the film adaptations of the Fifty Shades of Grey series. Mm-hmm. I liked some of those movies. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the Fifty Shades of Grey, but yeah. No, the no. other ones. <laughs> it's weird that you don't usually see a studio executive writing a movie. No. It's true. He actually first wrote the screenplay back in the 80s and first pitched it to Carpenter then, but John was kind of in the middle of the big peak of his career, so he was just too tied up. And then in 1989, Tony Randall, the director of Hellbound Hellraiser 2, Alex, (laughs) signed on to direct it, and not to be confused with Tony Randall of The Odd Couple. (laughs) He then had to leave, and then it shifted to Mary Lambert after Pet Cemetery came out, and then it circled back around to John. Hmm. So we almost had a version by the Hellbound Hellraiser 2 guy and by the Pet Cemetery woman. Mm. Fitting. This is the third film produced by Sandy King, John's wife. John again did the score with Jim Lang, with whom he collaborated on Body Bags. This is the only other film they worked on together. After sitting out memoirs in Invisible Man because he was busy shooting Double Dragon the movie, <laughs> this is cinematographer Gary Kibbe's seventh film for Carpenter. And just a handful of other returning names. We have actors Sam Neill and Peter Jason, editor Edward A. Warshelka, assistant director Andrew Robinson, stunt coordinator Jeff Amata, costume designer Robin Michael Bush, and a whole mess of the sound editing team. And the creature effects were again by K&B Studios and visual effects by Industrial Light and Magic. Sutter Kane is the hottest name in publishing. While his horror novels fly off the shelves and are increasingly tied to erratic and violent behavior among his readers, Kane suddenly goes missing before he can turn in the manuscript for his latest novel, In the Mouth of Madness. John Trent is an insurance fraud investigator brought in to track Kane down, begrudgingly joined by editor Linda Stiles. Even with Sutter's agent being shot down by cops after he attacks Trent with an axe, the investigator is quick to dismiss it all as a publicity stunt, and when he and Linda follow the trail to Hobbs End, the seemingly fictional New England town where all of Kane's books are set, Trent keeps arguing it's all actors and special effects as townspeople turn violent and erupt into mutations as Kane lords over evil children in the town's sacrilegious church. Linda is the first to fall victim to Cain as the manuscript of In the Mouth of Madness burns into her mind and starts twisting her alongside the townsfolk. When Trent confronts Cain, he's told he's just another character created by the story, and it's his task to deliver the book unto the world so as to set free all the horrific and ancient beings of our nightmares. Trent tries to escape this fate, but horrific visions of Cain counter him at every turn, and the book hits the shelves and is rapidly consumed by mutating readers in spite of all his attempts to prevent it. Grabbing an axe himself and killing a reader, Trent is locked in an asylum where he bookends the film by telling his tale of woe and horror to a stunned psychiatrist. That night, the film adaptation of In the Mouth of Madness hits theaters. Creatures rip through the asylum hall, setting Trent free as he wanders torn and abandoned streets until he finds a movie theater. Grabbing some popcorn and taking a seat, he watches his own story of the end of the world as he laughs and he laughs and he laughs. And then he cries. It was a crying laugh. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's important to say he is kind of breaking down by the end of it. (laughs) Emotions were coming from the mouth of madness. He had a lot of feelings. (laughs) So Alex, do you recommend In the Mouth of Madness? Uh, I thought long and hard about this. I'm going to go with a no. Really? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go with a soft no, because there was a lot I did still like about it. But for this viewing, which we will try to hash out, it just did not work for me. But I would also like to go back and change my soft no for Prince of Darkness to a yes, because <laughs> it mm. made me retroactively appreciate that movie more. Interesting. And your thoughts on Halloween 3, Season of the Witch? The same, but I'm going to go with a no for Escape from L.A. now. <laughs> I thought about that. <laughs> we can do that here. All your opinions are evolving. The masters of carpentry, we are evolving. <laughs> this is Alex Appends the Series. <laughs> Angie, do you recommend the movie? This may be a first for me in a Carpenter film, so everybody prepare yourselves. I embraced. (laughs) Yes. 
I do recommend this movie. Yay! I had a feeling you would. It's not for everyone, by all means. I would be wary of who I recommended it to, but it was a good time. I enjoyed it. It's wacky. It's crazy. But yeah, I don't know. It, this one gripped me in the ways that a lot of his other movies haven't before now. I know one of your big issues with Carpenter is the pace. And this one, there's a lot more going on. Mm -hmm. So I figured this one would definitely click with you a little more. <laughs> and I do recommend it. I don't love it as much as I used to, and I think that's entirely for contextual reasons because of a few certain other things that I've seen since then that I'll get into in discussion. And I think there's a few things that kind of clash. I'm not a fan of KNB, and I think some of their makeup here is not that good. Yeah, I agree. And there's some bits of the script that I think clash, and I think the story itself is actually kind of thin. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot going on. A lot of the horror, I mean, a lot of it is jump scares, but it's effectively done jump scares. There's a lot of good building of dread, of horrific imagery that keeps relapsing and changing and growing and mutating. It's well put together. I like the lead. I like the concept. I like a lot of those scenes. There's a lot of this that really works for me. I went into this project thinking this would be one of my favorites by Carpenter. It's not, but I still really enjoy it. And I do think it is still one of his stronger movies of the 90s. Why don't we get into open discussion? One of the things that struck me about this is in the time since I saw it last and the time since I saw it now, I've seen Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Mm-hmm which is written by the same guy and is about this mysterious guy who's been driven insane and he tells of the town where all the Elm Street movies took place, which has now become <laughs> a twisted place where all the children have been killed and all the parents have been driven insane. And our characters go to that town and visit it and see all these horrific sights as Freddy is trying to use them to start spreading beyond the town. There are a lot of similar parallels between the plot. Hmm. I only saw that one once, so it's hard for me to remember much. That was where they went to the town where all the kids had been killed, so the parents are just kind of wandering around, and that's where you have the cameo by Roseanne and Tom Arnold. I right. That. That's burned into my brain. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, Mike DeLuca, and I read the script for this, almost all of the script is on screen as written. The ending's changed, but I'll get to that. Mike DeLuca has this very over-the-top writing style where everyone's kind of a caricature. Everything's a little weird and wacky. The script reads like a black... The script almost reads like freaked. Hmm. And what's fascinating is Carpenter directed everything in the script, but he kind of toned it down. And yet there's still a lot of garishness to it. Not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very unusual for Carpenter. Carpenter's usually very buttoned down and restrained. But there is this kind of wacky undercurrent. What this really reminded me of... Perhaps not quite as disorienting and unsettling, but almost like a David Lynch film. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Very, very dreamlike from one scene to the next. This is John Carpenter's Lost Highway. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm still watching Twin Peaks now, where you'll go from like a very dreamlike surreal sequence to odd screwball comedy mm -hmm. yeah. to like serious melodrama. Yeah. And then occasionally one of the scariest images you'll ever see. <laughs> yeah. It is this odd juggling of tones. But I think the dreamlike quality of it, at least for me, helps some of the weaker moments when it, the characters aren't quite as strong or things don't quite make it much sense. It's like, well, I've had dreams like this. This is kind of what Lovecraft stories are like, where reality starts unwinding. Real things are really existing, and it's just as you realize they exist, it undoes your mind. Because it's just so shocking to realize that this is what's really happening to you. Mm -hmm. I think this film does do that very effectively. The ending sequence where he's literally watching the film play out in a movie theater <laughs> and laughing and sobbing and just roaring out this emotion is a perfect ending. Yeah. I think my main problem with it is that for all of its meta storytelling, it's not really saying anything. No, it's not. I would agree with that. There's no actual commentary to go with it. No, it does seem like a collection of scenes of really cool, scary scenes. And when I say I don't recommend it, it's hard to say that because I feel like my version of not recommending it is, did I enjoy it this round? That's what mm -hmm. I usually use as my litmus test. But I would definitely recommend this to somebody because there's lots of interesting things to see, lots of cool things you might not have seen before. So I would recommend it in that. There's some great performances. 
There are some funny moments, but I never felt anchored all the way through, which I usually do in Carpenter films because I find him a very logical director that I really enjoy the way he approaches things because he always does it almost like a procedural. Whereas this, I didn't feel as anchored. But I also, as you said, it didn't really have a central thesis that kind of connected it all together. And that's where it's worth pointing out that this isn't John Carpenter's story. It is Mike DeLuca's. Exactly. Sure. Which when you were saying that, it all sort of made sense, especially when you compared it to uh, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, <laughs> which I never would have thought I would have said out loud. Freddy's Dead does not work as well as this at all. No. no. But I mean, the thing is, John Carpenter loves this movie. He still really loved the experience of making it. He was fully on board with the Lucas script. Mm. So I don't want to say that it was like, it's not Carpenter's vision or he was director for hire. He loved the script and kind of wanted to keep it as is. I know a lot of huge fans of this movie, mm. and I found it to be shocking because I remember it being very like ahead of its time. It was burned in my brain. It seemed almost the way you would see like a high def movie right now. And then seeing it now, I'm like, whoa, this is very 90s. <laughs> <laughs> I've had like five other people ask if they could be the guest on this show. Oh, I'm special. Yeah, it's a big one with people. I feel like I'm going to be torn apart. <laughs> well, we already had you signed on. Oh, okay. I got in there quick. I don't regret it. <laughs> it is interesting that whenever I ask someone if they wanted to be on the show, their go-to is almost always In the Mouth of Madness. Can I be on In the Mouth of Madness? You know, it may not have much of a message, but I do think most of the twists and turns are pretty clever, and that makes it entertaining for me. I guess I'm used to these kind of stories. It's like you hear author is driven insane by his own work, and I kind of actually expected Sam Neill to be the author and not realize he was the author. Oh, yeah. If that makes that any sense. Make like sense. kind of a hidden personality. So to find out that he was actually a character in the story really delighted me. And I liked him, you know, going into the movie theater and seeing himself quite literally on the screen. I thought those were nice little twists and turns that it didn't have to take that way, but taking those felt satisfying to me. And I should point out, the one big change from the script is that ending. Mm -hmm. In the script of Mike DeLuca's, after the interview, we follow the psychiatrist. As a psychiatrist is just kind of walking home and seeing everyone go crazy on the street, seeing people line up at movie theater, comes home, kisses his wife, doesn't realize that she's sitting there reading in the mouth of madness. <laughs> And as he goes to bed and they turn off the lights, you hear tentacles start to slither out. Mm. It's just not that shocking of an ending. The ending here, which was mostly John, that's about as perfect of a way as you could end this story of we are literally undone by the things that we consume. We are literally consumed by the things we consume. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we consume this horror, this entertainment, and it consumes us. And it's just an endless loop of a character watching himself on screen. I almost expected the final shot to be him watching himself, watching himself, watching himself. <laughs> that would have been cool. It gave me very Evil Dead vibes, the ending. Mm. It's a little more buttoned down than Evil Dead, but yeah. Definitely more buttoned down, for sure. <laughs> God, yeah, imagine the camera zooming in on a mugging Bruce Campbell. Uh, yeah! <laughs> Most of my issues with the story are just, I like what's there. I just wish it would go a little further into exploring how the reading the horror leads to mass violence, the whole consumer being consumed, yeah, the author literally being overtaken by his own creations, that kind of thing. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we even have that bit where he like literally rips a hole in himself in the fabric of the universe, yeah. but then he just keeps popping up again. Yeah, he's back next time because he was like, I have to hold the him back bus. and everything. Yeah. Yes, and that bus. <laughs> the blue thing i'm just like yeah. oh a blue filter that's terrifying guys <laughs> they did not put a blue filter they literally dressed everyone and dyed everyone blue are you serious really yes wow that's very interesting they literally had two costumes for everyone one was blue and one was regular uh, <laughs> i don't know how to feel about that and then i guess what tinted makeup too because wasn't their skin kind of well, yeah. very lightly blue yeah wow okay. it's the same effect as a blue filter though <laughs> We wanted to put all the money on the screen. And they didn't have much. This is only a $10 million budget. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think it was eight. And it looks really good. Like, it was shocking because it was going from not seeing it for, like, 15, 20 years or whatever. But it still mm. looks really good for, um, what is it, 94? When again, it's shot by a guy who's shot seven movies with them. Mm -hmm. Edited by a guy who's been editing with him since Big Trouble in China. 
And again, ILM came in and did effects like, you know, that bit where they're driving on the road and the road disappears Mm. and she looks out the window under the car and suddenly lightning lights up clouds underneath the car. I have no problem with any of that sequence. Anytime Mm. on the road with like her on the back of the bike, anything like that was scary as hell. Very good, yes. Mm -hmm. Which was much better than the exact same scene in Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, (laughs) where the guy is riding on the bus. And suddenly realizes the bus is floating in the air on a tornado, and Freddy appears dressed as the Wicked Witch of the West. I think it's the same movie. I think he just drew over that script with this script. I know, I'm like, is is it because, like, that movie people didn't like that one? So he's like, no, these scenes can work, I swear to you. (laughs) Well, but again, this is the script he wrote first back in the 80s that he had been sitting on for, like, a decade. Mm. I just picture him, like, highlighting the name Freddy and then writing in Sutter Kane. (laughs) (laughs) It's almost as though this film didn't get made, so he just kind of recycled parts of it into Freddy's Dead. And then suddenly this got made. But yeah, then you should go back and and change this then. Yeah. Yeah. It is weird thinking of those two films side by side. I think that, more than anything, has colored my opinion on the movie, but that's more just a contextual thing. I think I'm going to have to go watch Freddy's Dead again now just to compare. (laughs) I will honestly be curious to hear what you think of it if you do. It's very silly. (laughs) I don't hate Freddy's Dead. It's just overly goofy. It's very goofy, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a video game in it at one point. A person goes into a video game. Oh, and it's Freddy has the power glove. Yeah, and he's playing with power, isn't he? He says that. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. I will say I I loved Jurgen Brocknow as Sutter Kane, mm. though I would like to have seen more of him leading up to this. Like even if just in flashback, just seeing him suddenly in the town, it just that reveal felt like it was missing something, yeah. like yeah. something to contrast it against. They needed to do that '90s cliche where they show a video of him like talking about his book or something, or like an interview with him. Or whenever they bring Sam Neill in and and give him the lowdown on what the story is, actually flashback and kind of show like you would in a procedural. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I mean, there is also that kind of noir aspect of he's a detective on a case. He thinks everyone's just screwing with him. He thinks this is all bullshit yeah there's the femme fatale yeah Yeah. styles there's almost as much raymond chandler in this as there is lovecraft i can see that for sure Mm -hmm. i think that might have been my major issue with it this time around i think that a lot of the horror and like the crazier aspects of the film would have gone over better for me if the characters acted a little bit more grounded yeah like from the get-go he's like laughing everything off like very cavalier even when things should be really frightening for him he's like Come on out, you old bitch, to the innkeeper, where I'm like, you probably shouldn't say that because she's probably just around the corner and maybe not a tentacle monster. She has another ankle she can handcuff you to. That's true, yeah. (laughs) And like Styles from the get-go is very off. But I mean, I think they do cover their bases with that one because apparently she had read part of the book, so she thinks she was already kind of like in the mouth of madness. Right. I agree with you. And it's, again, something that I wish they would have gone a little further with. Like, if he's going to be a detective in a story, either go full on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or subvert expectations by having him be like an unconventional detective. Mm -hmm. Granted, he is someone who keeps a horn in his car that he wakes people up with. Yeah, that was rude. Yeah. How many people has he done that to? (laughs) I don't know. And then Styles is just a very underdeveloped character in general. Yeah, I didn't like her too much. I felt so sorry for her. I didn't like her, but it does that thing that I dislike in horror films where the jump scares are for us. Mm-hmm. And they ended up being mostly for her with all the stuff when it should have been for Sam Neill. But yeah. most of the time it's just scaring this poor woman where he is just like, <laughs> whatever. And then like suddenly it switches to him. So you don't get that buildup of things like slowly getting weirder and weirder like it would be in like a Stephen King book for per se. So Mm -hmm. it really just hits him right off the bat where suddenly everyone's a tentacle monster. But for her, she gets this slow built up of terror and then she's removed from the equation and just becomes a crab monster. Yeah. I kind of like that that's where her story leads. But again, it's like Halloween 3 where a potentially interesting female character who then is just completely removed from the third act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, I wish that there had been more development of he is coming to this as an outsider. She is coming to this as someone who has read the words, but in a different way way than other people Mm -hmm. because she is the one who is helping to shape it but in a different way i would like to have explored how their alternate perspectives to this brought them to the effects of the words in a different way Mm -hmm. and again you know also he is a character is she a character we don't know who is and who isn't a character in the story yeah it's very unclear at the end like is charlton heston's character just pretending like he never knew about her Mm -hmm. because he doesn't want to explain the disappearance 
disappearance yeah. or was it really all in Sam Neill's brain all along? And again, like the uh, lady at the inn who was there for just us to see, the whole movie is, it didn't even need to happen because Sam Neill already delivered the manuscript. <laughs> yeah, and there should have been something different there in terms of like how the book got to the market. Because mm-hmm. I know part of the thing is you're the person who is supposed to bear these words to the world and it happens off screen. And do you even need the words? Did he even need to write this book? Because all you need to do is shove someone's face in it and it glows and then they're crazy. <laughs> I have this weird time theory that I was coming up with because it was way too late last night because the first guy with the axe, the uh, editor, I think. Agent. Yeah, the agent. He comes out of a video store when he's crazy. And I'm like, so maybe the movie's already out. <laughs> he saw the trailer. Yeah, he saw the trailer and that uh, tipped him over the edge. <laughs> Why did you put that trailer on best of the best three? <laughs> And this is where the film is very good pastiche. I like mm-hmm. the way that it references and reuses tropes and all that stuff. I'm mm-hmm. someone who likes pastiche. That's kind of where I've had a bit of an issue with people who are so against just the mere concept of tropes these days. Because I like to see how tropes are kind of reused and reassembled. Oh, I love it. I love tropes. I love cliches. I love it all. You can yeah. find a new way to do everything. And I'm it's sure. all in Speed Racer. <laughs> it's like the word trope itself has become a bad word. It's mm-hmm. true. I kind of like disliked it at first. First, but I resist all change and new words and things like that. <laughs> but uh... <laughs> but I do wish I mean, he has a marvelous framework for something that if he had just tried to explore a little bit more of, so what does this all mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like he suggests so much without really getting underneath it all at all. I do feel like I kind of filled in a lot of the blanks with my Stephen King knowledge. Yeah. I could see that. So that that helped it to work. (laughs) And that's what I used to feel like. Like I felt like I'm getting more out of this than I actually am. But I think that a large part of that is because he's tapping into such familiar stuff that he's relying on the audience to fill in his blanks. Right. Yeah, because I could see that absolutely. There's a Stephen King short story about this couple that kind of like take a wrong turn when they're walking somewhere. I don't really remember it too well. Not Children of the Corn, is it? It's not Children of the Corn. No, it's in Nightmares and Dreamscapes or something. They kind of like go around a bush or something. Oh, the Lovecraftian place. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yes, it says like the Yogg the Sagoth right or whatever it is. I don't know the creatures' mm-hmm. names. I didn't even know they were H.P. Lovecraft creatures at the time until later when I'm like, hey, I know that. And it just gets weirder and weirder. And I like that build up and I wish they'd kind of done it just a little bit closer to that. It's not unsuccessful. I don't want to keep sounding like I'm negative on this movie because it is not bad. It just kind of disappointed me (laughs) this round. Yeah, that's fair. And again, like then when you get to the town, it does feel like you're at like a Renaissance festival town where everyone's just kind of playing a part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like all this stuff is just happening around you. Like he's coming and he's taking over the children. Well, where's that story? You know, and you get Vigo, Vigo the Carpathian. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. Only mildly distracting. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> who has his like face bitten out by his five-year-old, which again happens off screen. Mm. Right, yeah. There's a lot of people with messed up lips. That and seems to be like the big yeah. theme, the pre-tentacles. Yeah. Well, his are natural, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get into the K&B effects where, I mean, I like some of the monsters, but a lot of the people mutating mm-hmm. and, you know, like, here's just a big puffy eye. You they know? just look too rubbery and- It did, yeah. Like, too obviously fake to me. Yeah. And like, you know, the blood looks too painted on. Mm-hmm. That's honestly has always been my problem with K&B is it looks a little too Don Poe. Halloween masky. Mm-hmm. I know K and B have their fans, and I know Greg Nicotero has gone on to do some amazing stuff, especially with The Walking Dead. But in the '90s, they were literally the people you went to when you couldn't afford anyone else. Oh wow! And again, this was a cheap movie. This was only eight million dollars. They are the people that you go to when that's your budget. Yeah. They did a great job with that budget. They did a great job on a few specific things. No, I mean, he made the movie look good. I don't know about them. (laughs) The creature effects left a bit to be desired, but I think the movie looked good on $8 million. Mm -hmm. Well, and I will say the old lady, when you see her in her tentacle monster form, they had filmed that with K&B effects, but were so disappointed in it that they redid that scene. And that's just like a two foot tall rod puppet. (laughs) That Mm. makes sense. Yeah, that kind of showed. (laughs) Yeah. Sounded like they added effects from the thing, like the sound effects. Well, and that's honestly where my memory of this was that this was the reunion of Carpenter and Rob Bottin who did the thing effects. Uh, it's not. No. That would have been cool. No, it definitely doesn't look as good as I remember it. And then like you have the bit where like they're running out of the inn and there's just this random monster standing there like a creature from Guyver. <laughs> 
as he's just like standing there. Like, oh. <laughs> I don't know if I remember that. <laughs> There's a bit where they run out of the hotel and they see in the greenhouse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, got okay. it, got There's it. just a monster just standing there. Right. And he's just kind of waving his arms. <laughs> yeah, they kind of did it behind doors, which I think was a smart move where everything's sort of like happening behind frosted glass. And I'm like, that's smart. Keep doing that. Yeah. I'm fine with that bit where he's running down the tunnel and there's this wall of horrors pouring after him. Wall of stop mm-hmm. motion horrors. <laughs> no, that wasn't stop motion. That was a full wall of like 30 creatures all operated by different people. Wow. Okay. That's where all the money went. I see. <laughs> the money shot. I like that they're very selective in what you see. I like the design of the tunnel. And I like that lead up to it where she's reading the quote from the book as he's seeing this horror come towards him. Yes. That was very good. And that quote is almost verbatim from Lovecraft. Mm. I was going to say it sounds like what I would imagine Lovecraft to read like. And yeah, it is a very effective scene, that scene. Lovecraft was notorious for not telling you what was being seen, just telling you how horrible it was and how it affected people. <laughs> I like that. Where You expect this giant door that they've set up, this giant pulsating door is going to burst open. But no, it's the author who literally tears himself open into pages of a book. Mm. Yeah. And then Sam Neill looks through it and his reaction is her reading his reaction from a book. Mm. No, that's pretty cool. I like that. The only thing that would have made it better is if the stuff she was reading was actually on those pages. And I don't think mm. they were because I was sitting there trying to read it, but it was I don't think it was the same thing. Well, you don't want to bleed from your eyes and turn into a monster, do you? (laughs) We would miss you. But it would have been a little more meta and made me feel afraid. I don't know. (laughs) I have to say, this movie is poorly lacking in a novelization. Yes, surprisingly, isn't it? This is definitely a movie that needed something to just kind of make it more of a literary experience. Mm. And I should point out, I was going to save this for the end of the episode, but this this is actually a good time to drop it in. And we still have to talk about the cast. We'll get to the cast. Mm -hmm. Let me just go through really quickly what the release of this movie was and how it did at the box office. Because this leads into one specific thing that I think we want to talk about. After playing at a few festivals in late 1994, In the Mouth of Madness was released on February 3rd, 1995. It debuted at number four, behind the debuts of The Jerky Boys and Boys on the Side. Wow. With Legends of the Fall still number one in its seventh week of release. Mm. Oh, all for Brad Pitt's hair. Yeah. (laughs) So the next weekend, Billy Madison and the Quick and the Dead came out, and Mouth of Madness dropped to number seven. Wow, what bad time for this to come out. (laughs) (laughs) The following week, the Brady Bunch movie Mm. (laughs) opened. What a snapshot. And Madness dropped to 14. And then by its fourth week, In the Mouth of Madness is no longer in the top slot. And its domestic gross was just over $8 million, which was the entirety of the budget. How many Mm. times has this happened to John Carpenter by this point? It feels like every time we talk about the box office, it just is gone. (laughs) Surprisingly, though, this had some of his best reviews from the 90s. But half those reviews also point out something else that I want to bring up. Mm. Again, this was New Line Cinema. New Line Cinema, we've talked about the connection with Freddy Krueger. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Four months before this, in October of 1994, was the release of Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Mm. Which, again, is about the character breaking into reality, mm. out right. of fiction, the lines being blurred between am I a real person or a character in a movie, yeah. you know, talking to the director. But the thing about Wes Craven's New Nightmare is that it's kind of weaker in terms of how it's plotted, but it's actually more thematic and actually gets into the philosophy of it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That came out four months earlier, and a lot of the critics were like, didn't we just watch this movie? (laughs) Even Roger Ebert, who gave it two out of four, was like, this isn't that bad, but we just saw it done kind of better. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, and there are are a lot of aspects that I like better in In the Mouth of Madness, because West Coast New Nightmare has a lot of problems. It sure does. Mm -hmm. But it not only brings up these ideas, but it actually does dig into them in terms of violence in media and the effect that can have on an audience and, you know, the meaning of characters in fiction and all that stuff. It's also scarier. It's more effective as a horror film. It is. New Nightmare. I think about fondly, but when watching, I'm just like, oh, this doesn't hold up. (laughs) God, it's weird. I never would have thought of bringing up two Elm Street movies while talking (laughs) about this. But it's like, I can't think of it now without thinking of Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare and Wes Craven's New Nightmare. We're switching focus. Everybody, we're going to become a Freddy podcast. (laughs) (laughs) 
I'm just thinking of uh, in Scream when don't they call him like Wes Carpenter or something like that? <laughs> they do. Yeah, yeah. yeah the yeah. lines were blurring. <laughs> it's worth mentioning. I was going to do a project going through all of Wes Craven's films when suddenly Alex, you were like, "Hey, let's go through all of John Carpenter." Oh, there you go. There you go. I saved you from watching Swamp Thing. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, why don't we just talk about some of the cast, like Sam Neill. Oh, I love Sam Neill. No problems. Yeah. I think he could have played it a little less smirking because he's kind of an asshole and everything like that. But his performance is very committed, very animated. I like him a lot. I wish he had been a little more sincerely caught up in the scenario instead of the smirking bastard. I don't know. I think it fits the idea that he's just a character in a story, though, that he's not ultimately realistic or fleshed out because he's just what Sutter Kane wrote on the page, you know? Hmm. I think for me, it took us back. You weren't here for that, Angie, but mm. two months ago we did Memoirs of an Invisible Man, which is the first film that Sam Neill and John Carpenter did where he plays the villain. Oh, okay. Where he's a government agent who's chasing our character. And in some ways, he's playing a very similar character. Mm. I mean, obviously, the main thing I know him from is Jurassic Park. Yeah. Obviously, that guy's a scientist, but he is kind of one of those actors that largely plays the same guy no matter what he's in. He's got that kind of fatherly quality, but also a little bent. Mm -hmm. He's got a glint in his eye. He's always got a glint yeah. in his eye. Yeah. And then, of course, my other big one from around this era was Event Horizon. Yes. Which, again, ends with him, like, going completely insane. He does, indeed. <laughs> I honestly thought that his line from Event Horizon, where he's screaming out, Do you see? <laughs> was from this movie. <laughs> I love Sam Neill as an actor. Again, I think they could have gone in a slightly different direction with the character, but I think he is incredibly committed to how he plays mm -hmm. it. I mean, like, yeah, when he just wakes up, sees the bus is blue, and just starts screaming. Yep. Yeah. He does a good job. And one of the introductory bits is Sam Neill, before he became an actor, was a director. Huh. Hmm. And he actually did suggest a number of the shots in this movie, like shooting certain things from overhead angles. Oh, cool. And John loved hearing about it. Okay. Carpenter is interesting. If you get him paired up with another director, he'll just sit down and like the audio commentary for Christine is the guy who played Arnie, who has since gone on to a director. Half that commentary is John Carver just interviewing him about his directorial. <laughs> He's highly <laughs> collaborative. And then there's Julie Carmen as Linda Stiles. What do I know her from? Is it just Shoot Me? I was surprised what else I had seen her in, because we had talked about Tommy Lee Wallace here on the show, John Carpenter's old buddy who then went off and directed movies. She was the lead vampire in Fright Night Part 2. Oh, interesting. Have either of you seen Fright Night Part 2? No. I have indeed. I love the Fright Night series. Of two films. Yeah, she is the sister who comes to town trying to get revenge for the death of her brother. Wow. She's completely different in that movie, so kudos to her. Angie, if you want to see something interesting. <laughs> she's a vampire who becomes the host of a late night TV show that she turns into an interpretive dance hour. All right. Yeah, it's weird. It's an odd movie. I've seen the first Fright Night. I've never seen the second one. It's it's a thing. <laughs> and again, vampire bowling. Yeah. It's got some good scenes in it. It's got some good stuff. Okay. I don't dislike it, Yeah, but it's a weird movie. It is very weird. Lots of slow -mo. Sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> it's Tommy Lee Wallace. Tommy Lee Wallace is a very strange guy. Uh -huh. He also directed uh, Stephen King's It, the miniseries. Oh, okay. wow. More slow-mo than that. <laughs> I think the character's underdeveloped, but I like her because she has this unconventional feel to her. She's very spacey, which I liked. Mm. I like the way she reacts to a lot of things. Dreamlike. Well, it's not always dreamlike, but there's always this kind of frustration with her, too. Mm. There's even this great bit where she's trying to talk to Trent, and she just gets so frustrated that she just goes and stands up against a wall and just like takes a minute just to calm herself down. I don't know. I, <laughs> I like bits like that. And there is the one scene where it's like she starts kissing him and is kind of like, he's writing me this way. Like, but I like that there's not really a sexuality to their relationship. Yeah, because Julia, when they started kissing, was offended. She's like, why are they doing that? And I'm like, he's writing her that way. Yeah, I was pretty aggravated with that scene, too. I think I literally went, what the fuck? <laughs> I like two things. One, I like that Trent reacts to it in the same way mm. as he's like this. What what the hell's going on here? Yeah. And I like that they don't prolong it. They just kind of have it be this little moment that happens and it feels off. But the movie plays it as an off moment. I kind of wanted them to expand on that a little bit more as if suggesting that maybe Sutter Kane is a bad writer and that mm. not only is this book taking over the world, it is a bad book taking over the world. <laughs> and then what's interesting is the odd sexuality kind of comes in in the scene where he corrupts her 
where, you know, she's like stroking him and the monster is on his back. Yeah. And then like, you know, forcing her head down into the book. Yeah. Well, you know, Stephen King's sex scenes are usually pretty terrible. I wonder if that was a reference. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, now I'm just thinking of the teenage boys and Christine again. Mm. Speaking of, (laughs) hey, did anyone recognize that paper boy when he wakes up on the road and asks which way to the highway? Uh, I don't know. His appearance felt kind of forced. That was Anakin Skywalker himself, Hayden Christensen. That was my joke! (laughs) Forced! (laughs) From Star Wars. (laughs) I totally didn't get that. Okay. (laughs) I'm hilarious. Trust me. (laughs) And then stuff like there's the whole recurring bit of the boy on the bicycle who turns into the old man. Which I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that you could definitely like see in a Stephen King story. Mm -hmm. I thought it was John Carpenter in a cameo when he was the old man. (laughs) (laughs) No, it was actually still just the kid. But and that's my main problem is that that's another effect that's kind of ruined by the makeup. Yeah. Yeah. Though I like the bit when he comes across them again. And Linda is riding on the back of the bike, just kind of waving her arms. That's a nice moment. That was creepy. I actually think it's very effective when she turns bad and you have like the bit where like he sees her on the other side of the door and there's tentacles writhing underneath it or the bit where she like crab walks out. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that. You didn't like that? Maybe it's the effects again, but it just looked really silly to me. Yeah, I could see that. Kind of like a one step too far thing, a little exorcist thing. Mm -hmm. I did like the shot of her head starting to peek around the door right before it. But yeah, I can see that. Mm. So what positive things do you see? <laughs> uh, hey, David Warner. David Warner shows up as a psychiatrist. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a good actor. Like, he was selling it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we had him. John Glover is the guy in the institution. John Glover, yeah. Moses mm-hmm. himself. Charlton yeah. Heston? <laughs> uh, that's a get. How do they get him? Yeah, where did Charlton Heston come from in a John Carpenter movie? Maybe they're both <laughs> Western fans and they met. You just know that Carpenter probably spent half the day on set just picking stories from him. Oh, I mm-hmm. bet. Fairly subdued role for him, too. It is. And it's just, it's a very small, yeah, just playing the publisher of a book company. Mm -hmm. But he does it really well. And I I love the whole thing of the film comes out next Thursday. (laughs) (laughs) I do still like the movie. It's a film that I think its main problem is that it just isn't as much of what it could be. Mm -hmm. Sure. Even though, you know, not all the makeup holds up, the editing and the cinematography, the way that the scares are shot and cut together Mm -hmm. are incredibly effective. Like, I mean, you have that bit where she walks into the room, sees a typewriter there, walks out, comes back to the room, and it's an entirely different room with him and a typewriter. And out of nowhere, a hand shoots down on, grabs her shoulder, and she looks around, there's nothing there, and it never comes up again. What just grabbed her? But the movie has brought us to a place where, yeah, hands are just going to shoot out of unexpected places. I think my main problem with the entire thing is the script. Because I have no problem with, like, the way it's shot. I like the makeup effects a little bit, and uh, I think it might be one of John Carpenter's weakest scores. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't care for the score. It felt a little too 90s. The guitars. When it first started, I was like, so either this is Metallica or someone trying to be Metallica. It did sound a little Enter Sandman. (laughs) Yeah. This is a period, and we'll see this in more Carpenter films coming up, where he's trying to take his themes, but instead of doing them synth, he's bringing in actual people to play the themes on instruments. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know, like, in Ghosts of Mars, he's going to bring in, like, Buckethead and Anthrax. Right. Okay. My one thing that I will say is that it feels a little out of place because it doesn't really fit the tone of the movie. Right. Yeah. But there's a lot of it that I still like, and the guitars are only used here and there. But I mean, yeah, the opening credit sequence where it's like the shots over the book going through the printing press and all that stuff and the guitars playing. I was thinking of the opening of Christine. I was thinking of that too. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, are we literally going to see a book be born bad (laughs) and like kill someone on the printing press? The mangler. (laughs) Someone walks over, opens up a book and a dead body spills out of the dust jacket. (laughs) You know, the mangler would have been great if it had this score. (laughs) John Carpenter's The Mangler, that would have been (laughs) interesting. It probably would have been a lot less garish. (laughs) Anything else we can think of that we want to bring up? I'm trying to think of some positive stuff. I feel like a jerk because (laughs) it's not a bad movie. No, and and even the script. My main problem with the script is that it just doesn't go as far as I would like it to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like everything that's there. I just wish there was something more there. Mm -hmm. That's my main problem with The Fog, too, was I'm fine with everything that's there. It's just missing that extra depth, that extra 
oomph, you know, mm-hmm. that, that extra connective tissue. Yeah, it's like I like it almost because it reminds me of other things I like. You know, like there's a yeah. lot of Silent Hill similarities here in terms yes. of this strange town and things changing and the protagonist not quite realizing what's going on and certainly a lot of King stuff. I like Silent Hill a lot more than I do this. Yeah. yeah. Kind of reminds me of The Ring. Like The Ring yeah. is like mm-hmm. a modern, that whole viral spreading, even though it's videotapes. Yeah. I was actually thinking about The Ring while watching it because I'm like, The Ring doesn't really have much depth to it, but it's effective for what it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it balances its mood a bit better, the ring, where it has that sort of like mounting dread, whereas this one swings into like a little bit of comedy, a little (laughs) bit of action, a little bit of a a guy running by in an axe and just going, fuck you! (laughs) I'm just like, (laughs) that's pretty silly. (laughs) And I think that's also part of the problem is that, again, the script was written as a black comedy Mm -hmm. and Carpenter directed it as a horror movie. Right. Which, you you know, Carpenter has done that in the past where he's mixed tones. He can juggle. Mm-hmm. He can juggle. He, he can juggle. I just think part of that is that, again, this is not something that originates with him. Right. It's the script for me. It's the script. Everything yeah. else is fine for me. <laughs> and again, I am going to be very curious to hear what the two of you say the next time you watch Freddy's Dead, The Final Night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see when that happens. Yeah. yeah. Julia worked with the director once. Rachel Talalay? Yep. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not surprised. Oh, and, oh, I have to mention. This is Carpenter's first film shot in Canada. I know that. It's a big deal. <laughs> shot in Toronto. Not only shot in Toronto, but a couple scenes are shot in my hometown. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I've always known that. That's one of the things all, all us <laughs> people from my town are just like, well, that's one of those things shot there. Which town is it? Georgetown, Ontario. Nice. We've also had uh, Follow That Bird shot there. Uh, bits and pieces <laughs> awesome. of Follow That Bird. And um, uh, uh, I can't even remember what it was called, but something with Al Pacino and Colin Farrell. Carol. Oh. Yeah. The CIA one? The CIA one. <laughs> the recruit? The recruit, yeah. Our mayor gave Al Pacino a key to the city, which does not exist. <laughs> she just made up a reason to meet Al Pacino. That's funny. <laughs> this is the key to Hobbs End. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I think what was filmed in Georgetown was in and around the bed and breakfast that they go to. Mm. I don't know if it was like the exteriors or something, but it's not much. But it's like a couple scenes. Okay. But yeah, no, everything was filmed in Ontario for this, even the interiors. Yeah, the uh, big cathedrals in Markham. Mm. Yeah, no, and that's the thing is, he said on the commentary was everyone thought that that church was a matte painting. He's like, no, that's a real church. (laughs) No, no, no. We have some big, crazy churches going on of all different religions all throughout Ontario. It's interesting. We've got like mosques and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, all sorts of stuff going on. Mm. And again, with the tone of the script, it's like, yeah, you could see like the creepy kids who ate a dog's leg who are like, you're our mommy. It's mommy's day. Or the Did they eat that leg. dog's leg? Was that implied? Yeah, because they literally cast a three-legged dog and then found a four-legged dog that matched him. Oh. Yeah, because they're chasing the dog repeatedly. Right. And then you get to the point where the dog is there with them and now he's missing a leg and they have blood on their mouths. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't quite connect that. that, but no, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, like the kids saying, it's you're our mommy and it's mommy's day or, you know, the cop of like, hey, buddy, you want some? Those play like scenes that you would see in like a Nightmare on Elm Street type thing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. especially with how they progressively get more horrific. Yeah. Or a Stephen King short story. Oh, yeah. Because King, he'll like lock onto something and then repeat it and repeat it mm-hmm. and slightly alter the context as he does that. Like yeah. that library policeman. That whole thing is like constantly seeing things differently. It's the quintessential looking at things as they get creepier and creepier Mm. kind of, yeah, short story. He does that a lot. And like The Shining did that a lot too. Definitely, definitely. How it repeat phrases and methods. Yeah, Mm -hmm. he keeps seeing this poster and it keeps changing and stuff like that. Like in The Shining with the photos and stuff. Yeah. Do you know who did the art for like the book covers and stuff? I don't. That's something I wanted to look up. It looked really familiar to me, but I couldn't place where. Let me just see if I can find it here in the art department. It might be Joe Griffith. I don't know. It's like I feel like either on album covers or something I have seen art like that before. Yeah. I would be curious to learn who that was. Mm -hmm. A lot of it looks like Tool album covers. (laughs) Kind of, yeah. (laughs) John Carpenter's Tool. (laughs) John the Carpenter's Tool. Now I just, okay. (laughs) Match made in heaven. Wow, okay. Um, (laughs) 
I do like that scene with the agent where they're sitting there having a conversation and you just see him across the street coming closer and closer. Effective scene. Mm -hmm. A lot of effective scenes. I think that's one of the reasons why I come down on certain John Carpenter films because he's usually so great that anything less, I'm just kind of like, I feel like I'm nitpicking it. But (laughs) uh, no, and the thing is, yeah, we have our problems with the script and all that stuff, but I think he directs the hell out of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a well-directed film. There's a lot of really effective stuff in it. It's very stylish, I found. I just didn't see as much substance as I wanted this round. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't attack me in the mouth of Madness fans because I know you guys (laughs) really like this movie. (laughs) Well, hey, I was one of them. I think a large part of it is because of our age group. Yeah. And again, we got into this with Escape from L.A. Yeah. Is that it was the Carpenter movie of our generation. This is our, like, senior first James Bond film or something like that. When, again, this was a movie that bombed in the movies, but it did gangbusters on video. And it became a big yeah. cult hit on video. For indoor kids like myself, home video was, like, the way to go. Like, that was <laughs> my movies, <laughs> my experience. I mean, that's how I came across it was, you know, In the Mouth of Madness is just a catch catchy title to a teenager browsing the horror section, you know? Mm -hmm. And I know that that caught a lot of my friends' attention. I know that's why a lot of people in our group, again, we said a ton of people wanted to be guests on the show. That was like one of those things that just grabbed them and introduced a lot of people of our age group to Carpenter. Yeah. And it was labeled with his name too, right? Yeah. Oh, that that was a common thing for Carpenter films in general. Right. But I guess my point is like, you know, you knew he was a horror master from Halloween or whatever. So you wanted to dig more into his work and it was easy to find on video. Well, I know that was what made Carpenter and Wes Craven as well known as they were, was they were both the directors who would put their names in front of their titles. Mm -hmm. Like it was Wes Craven's New Nightmare, Wes Craven's Vampire from Brooklyn. Yeah. Right. And then Wes took it a step further with his whole Wes Craven Presents, where he had Jack all to do with the movies. He would Mm -hmm. literally just, people would pay him so he would put his name in front of them. Tarantino did that too. Like those Tom Clancy Rainbow Six books. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> the trailer, though, the trailer was, like, killer because there's so many, like, great visuals, like, tearing himself apart like a book. The movie, like, really appealed to horror fans, people who might not actually go to the theater, and people mm-hmm. like my uncle who would look for, like, holographic covers to movies and be like, this looks cool. Because <laughs> he'd never look at trailers, he would just look by the video box. And then again, Event Horizon was again, very big at the time, and Sam Neill, there was a lot of crossover between In the Mouth of Madness and Event Horizon fans, you know? Mm. Yeah. Which I think is a very similar film where it's a lot of pastiche that doesn't really have anything to say, but it's very effectively done. Yeah. It was a big film for people of our generation. And also, I think because of the way that it was a pastiche, it again, it seemed a lot fresher at the time because I hadn't read or seen a lot of the things that it was referencing. Absolutely. Yeah, I could see if I would have seen this, you know, at like 17, I probably would have thought it was genius. Yeah. And it is very effective to you having seen it now that you you know as as the acclaimed Stephen King expert that you are (laughs) yes (laughs) but I mean like for me having loved it as a teenager and now coming back to it I think this is where it's actually been helpful that I spent like 15 years away from it coming back to it now that I've accumulated all this stuff because in that time since I've read as much Lovecraft as I had I've read as much King as I have yeah and coming to it now I'm like okay I see what you're I, I now I get everything that you're referencing Now I wish that you would have gone a little further into it, though. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it really hurts that it's not as deep of a film as it could be. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm going to be curious to see if we get some backlash from the other people who wanted to be on this. (laughs) Yeah. It's, I'm sorry, it's just not a deep movie, no. but it's a defective movie. But we like it, for yeah. the most part. <laughs> you you can be a shallow movie and still be effective. Yeah. Of course. And it's not as shallow as other shallow movies could be. No. You know, it still has some neat characters. The cast is great. It's very well shot and edited. Mm-hmm. I just want a little more from it. Yeah. <laughs> This kind of feels like it's coming to a close. Yeah. I'll go soft recommend. Soft recommend for me. Soft recommend? Mm. Okay. Angie, you still recommending? Yeah, I still do. I think especially for people who like the other things like King or Silent Hill or other Lovecraftian inspired things, I think it's definitely worth a watch if you haven't seen it before. And again, Silent Hill is a great thing to point out because it's not only referencing like Lovecraft stuff, but it's that melding point of Lovecraft and King. Mm -hmm. I think that's what was interesting about this movie is that like deep, deep Lovecraft fans a 
accuse it of being too king. <laughs> and I've seen deep, deep king fans accuse it of being too Lovecraft. <laughs> what I like is that it's got that kind of nice middle ground and it, it kind of plays on the areas that king and Lovecraft overlap each other. Right. And it's not fully going one way or the other. It's kind of going in both directions. I, I like that. I like that it's not just one or the other, like a lot of the Lovecraft movies are. There are people who actually do hold this up as the best Lovecraft movie because it plays on those themes so well. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, it is. <laughs> I like Reanimator, but Reanimator is a very goofy movie. I haven't seen Reanimator in like 20 years, so. It holds up pretty well, but it's just, it's a very goofy movie. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, no, I, I've spent like most of this podcast criticizing it, and yet I still <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, though. Yeah. You can yeah. still criticize something and enjoy it. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't love it like I used to, but I look back on it fondly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just maybe don't watch Freddy's Death <laughs> in conjunction with it. Genuinely, I want to hear what people think about that comparison. <laughs> Apparently, you do a Freddy marathon, and then you go into this movie, since people were also complaining, you know, Wes Craven's new Nightmare comparisons there as well. Why well, did that where last time I went through all the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, I then ended it by watching The Cell, and it was better than all of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. <laughs> and I say this as a fan of Nightmare on Elm Street. So, anyways, Alex, any final thoughts? Sorry, fans. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I like it still. Just not as much. <laughs> Angie, any final thoughts? Just look at it as a really weird dream that you're watching, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah you have a much better attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it, its main thing is don't go in expecting more than it is. Yeah. Right. But it, it is still a good, absolutely for the 90s horror movies. Well, I treat all of these as writing my reports on these movies, and I have to put my critical pants on. So, yeah, I think that's going to bring us to a close. Angie, we'll have you back the month after for our next episode as we do Village of the Dam. Yes. That's going to be interesting because I've always had weird mixed thoughts on Village of the Dams, but it would be interesting to see it in conjunction with this. I haven't seen it since mm -hmm. it first came out, and I just liked it because Christopher Reeve was in it and he's Superman. <laughs> <laughs> I did cover it a few years ago and I hate love remakes, but again, I have a lot more context for this movie, especially the history behind it. Okay. Mm, okay. And our Memoirs of Visible Man episode, we talked about this four year gap of John Carpenter's career. I actually found a lot more information and it ties directly into Village of the Dam. Nice. Mm, okay. We'll get into that then. Anyways, I think that brings our episode to a close. Thank you again for joining us, Angie. Oh, no problem. Thank you for having me. And where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, easiest thing to do is to follow Phoenix Anu on Twitter. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Anyways, in the mouth of madness. In <laughs> the mouth of madness. Everyone all set to start? I, I think, think so. so. I watched it late last night, so it's almost like it was a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Fitting. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I gotta say, the audio commentary, which I watched yesterday, a bit of a letdown. Oh, interesting. Mm. It's Carpenter and his cinematographer, and it's literally just Carpenter grilling him about, so what kind of lights did you use here? <laughs> what kind uh. of lens did you <laughs> It's for the entire commentary. Mm -mm. Yeah, he didn't have Kurt Russell with him this time, sadly. There you go, yeah. He doesn't have his <laughs> partner in crime. Sam Neill didn't want to join in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been interesting.